Before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Cadigal people of the Uere Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Thank you everybody for being here today. The order of the proceedings for today is firstly, Lynn Raleigh, senior lecturer and academic uh, leader of the curriculum in the university, will introduce our guest speaker, Associate Professor John Bradley. And then John will share his ideas with us. John, thank you very much for being here with us. Lynn, please. Marang nan gari, meng wile gawara juri. Marang nan gari, meng wile gawadari. Meng wile gawadari, meng wile gawidari. Meng wile gawadari, marang nan gari, marang nan gari. As a Wiradjuri Gamilaroi woman, I'd like to acknowledge my elders and also thank the people of the Eora Nation for the many things that they have done that uh, helped the rest of the Aboriginal people in Australia survive. And I acknowledge that we are standing on their land today. The um, speaker today is Associate Professor John Bradley and he's the Deputy Director of the Monash Indi Indigenous Centre at Monash University. He's been involved with Indigenous issues for the last 37 years, and I understand that he came into it as a teacher, so that's really good grounding as to why he's done so well. The bulk of his research has been undertaken with the Yanua people of the Northern Territory. He's undertaken research in regards to the Yanua knowledge concerning dugong, marine turtle, and dolphins. He's also been a senior anthropologist on two land claims under the Land Rights Act of the Northern Territory for, in 1976, and he's been involved with local ranger work groups uh, working in the intersection of Western and Indigenous ways of managing land and sea. John is also the author of The Singing Saltwater Country, a book that explores the richness of Yanangu song lines and knowledge, and in June this year, John will be producing 37 years of Yanangu linguistic research. Uh, John today will be talking about our knowledge, my knowledge, towards an intercultural understanding and how Australian Indigenous knowledge is not free. It's a multi-layered process and is acquired through years of moving through the land. Unlike Western knowledge, much of the way in what the, in what the West calls Indigenous knowledge is, pre, is predicated on the foundation of kinship, which includes both human and non-human kin. So this presentation today will focus on the Yanawu, Yanawu, sorry, Yanua. Yanua, thank you, <laughs> people of the southwest Gulf of Carpentaria in the Northern Territory, where John has undertaken field work for over 30 years. And the presentation will focus on how the land is the foundation for all kinds of knowledge, some of which Western ways of knowledge would categorise as anthropology, biology and ecology, and yet for the Yanua people, such categories have little meaning. This presentation will track the ways that knowledge may be held on a day-to-day -day basis by way of key examples. So for me today, the presentation will not only enlighten the theoretical, but also the practical practice of our disciplines. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the reality is, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for the people that are listed under here. You know, one doesn't get a PhD in an Indigenous community unless you have good teachers. And these are the good teachers that are still alive. So I pay my respects to them in their absence because that's why I stand here. 
I just want to begin with a, a few ideas that I hope I can then take through the rest of the presentation. And we begin with the idea that all knowledge systems contribute to an understanding of the world and are valid in and of themselves. And then I want to move into really what my own experience has told me. You know, we, we talk about practice and praxis, theory and actually being in knowledge. And these points have actually come by being in knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis. And I've seen examples of this in multitudes of ways, and it's part of what I want to talk about. Western ways of knowing are often held as the point of reference with the power to legitimate or to legitimize other knowledges. And by other, we could be talking about indigenous Australian knowledges or any other knowledge of people that is not of the West, that which we construct as the other. The assumptions and mechanisms of Western knowledge constructions are often concealed, frequently from the researchers themselves, as they are embedded within ontological and epistemological premises that has created its own self-validating frame of reference. And this is critical, because if we don't pay attention to this, we just colonize and we keep on colonizing. And it's really important we understand this notion of ontology and epistemology, because that's the only place where we can begin to decolonize, at least in Australia, 225 years of colonization. And therefore, it is then often the case that the validity of the other's knowledge systems are subjected to comparison and validation according to a criteria established by Western ways of knowing knowledge, of constructing knowledge, which in and of itself is really, at the end of the day, only one other way to know something. So, it must cause us to reflect on these very institutions. These very institutions that we get educated in, Sydney University, one of the premier universities in Australia, is only here as a result of history, which began with the French Enlightenment. There could have been another way, but this is what we have. These are the creatures I come to love. <laughs> this is the focus of a lot of my research, Dugong, um, marine turtles and dolphins. And part of what my research has shown me is while we can see these creatures as just a biological entity, for the people I work with, they are far more than that. They are kin. We can categorize them as non-human kin. But at the same time, the dugong and the turtles in particular are also food. And therein lies some particular tensions. But those tensions, it doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means we have to apply a deeper way of understanding as to how those tensions might work. So, over the years, the kind of work I do has been with scientists. In this picture, there are two lead Australian maritime scientists and indigenous rangers working on their ways of understanding that intersection between two ways of knowing, a very Western way of knowing, and an indigenous way of knowing. But we should always reflect on this map first. This map is really, should be burned into everyone's mind. Because if we consider that 225 years ago there were 270 languages here and 600 dialects, and that there are now less than 100 of these languages being spoken, what does it tell us? It tells us of loss, but do we really know what we have lost? And the enormous amount of knowledge we have lost. Because the interesting intersection of this map, if we look at it in a more ecological way, is that wherever we have linguistic diversity, we also have ecological diversity. And when ecological diversity suffers, so does linguistic diversity. And Australia is in the midst of both. We cannot separate these two. It is impossible. So, I work down in the Gulf of Carpentaria for the last 37 years, 1,000 kilometers from Darwin. The biggest town is called Borulula. And this is a, a bit of a blown up map of that same area. And this is a very important map, not just because of the names on it, but it also talks of one of the issues I just spoke to. There's Yanua. That's one of the languages I speak from this area. 
37 years ago, there were over 260 speakers of that language. Today, there are four really fluent speakers left, four old ladies. Wilangara, the language next to it, was extinct by 1901. Mara, the last fluent speaker of that language, died last year. Binbinga, no one left since the 1930s. Goranji, there are some hearers left, no speakers. Garawa, probably about 10 people. So in this map alone is enshrined a part of the whole colonial project and what the colonial project has done in Australia and has contributed to enormous loss. Not just of people, not just of language, but what is embedded in all those things. So here's another map of where I work, thanks to Google Earth. Now you can look at this map and you go, yes, we recognize geographic land features, but it's what we can't see that becomes critical. Embedded in this map are mining leases, port facilities, tourism enterprises, professional fishermen enterprising, um, pastoral leases, township boundaries, all of which are contesting in this land for money, for an idea to economically survive on this part of Australia. So they're all political processes. Every one of them is a political process occupying Yanua country. But we can look at this map in another way altogether. This map is this map. And this map still exists as well. This is the map of how Yanua families put themselves on that same country by four clans by which you in become involved through patrilineal descent, through your father and your great-grandfather and so on. And these are political land units as well. Each one of them is about politics, politics of family, politics of kin. It's a bit more complex than that. So, you know, if you come from this area of the green of the more darkish green, you know that the person in red is your mother's country. You know the person in the yellow is your mother's mother's country. And you know the person in the other green is your father's mother's country. So kinship is matched all through this country. And these dotted lines that we might assume to be a boundary are really the place at which your obligations in that land change. They are not points of exclusion. That's a very Western sense of a boundary. These dotted lines are about changing the way that you might relate to that sea and that land. And I mention the sea in particular because Eddie Marbo might have contrib contributed to Terra Nullius, a land without any inhabitants being turned on its head, but Australia still grapples with the idea of Mare Nullius. The sea is also possessed. The sea is also owned. And for sea people, there are vast vocabularies to talk about how that might be the case. Okay, another way of looking at this, this is a little bit more anthropological, but it gets to the point of where I want to go. There are those four clans again. Patrick clans, meaning small clans of finer detailed patrilineal descent. Then we have all these biological things underneath them. Tiger sharks, brogas, dingoes, sea turtles. These are the non-human kin that also exist in time and space with human beings. Now the reality is this is a very truncated picture. Every natural plant, animal, fish, bird, every natural phenomena can also be mapped on that. So the lists become many, many hundreds and hundreds of words long. Nothing can be excluded from this notion of kinship. In this system, feral animals are kept outside of it. 
but it's important to note that in some parts of Australia, feral animals are also included into this system. Camels, donkeys, horses, cats, dogs that are not dingoes. But I'm just today speaking for this area here. So here we have a stretch of land on the coast where I've worked. Up until about five years ago, it had no name on a map until some fishermen from Melbourne decided that's where they wanted to set up their fishing base to catch Barramundi, and they named it Sandy Head. And they went to the Northern Territory government and said, we want a name on all the maps of the Northern Territory now called Sandy Head, so that we know where we are, and everyone knows where we go to. But what they'd forgotten is there are already so many names on that country. To rename or to claim a rename is still one of the most powerful acts of colonization that we can contribute in this country. Sandy Head's there, yes, but so are so many other names. And each one of those names is a biography unto itself. That can be a biography of botany, a biography of geology, a biography of ecology, about something that is unique to that place name that is not to the other place names that are there. So if we extend Yanua country, there are over 2,000 place names over their land. Individual place names that old people can still recall at will. But what becomes even more important is when we turn the map into this. These are the ancestral beings that moved across that piece of country, created that piece of country, and are still residing in that country, both as power places in the country, but also the pelican, which still flies around the day, has its life source embedded in that country as well. Now, over the years, non-Indigenous people have often called these things the fairy stories, just nice stories that Aboriginal people have about country. Well, they're not. They are powerful reference points of identity, of being in the world, of being in relation to an environment. So when you see that, if there's a species there you recognize, such as a pelican, it's no longer just a pelican. An osprey is no longer just an osprey. And if you look down in the corner, a mosquito is no longer just a mosquito. It is all of a sudden kin. It has a meaning beyond the biological. Let's look at this big sand dune. It's a great place to go. Kids love going there, rolling down it, tumbling down it. Fantastic place. But through other eyes, you are actually looking at a wave. Not this kind of wave. A saltwater wave. And there are people, as in the bottom of this picture, who will say that that place is the place that gives them the very sense of who they are, the very sense of their identity, because that wave is their ancestor, as is the wave that is still crashing on the shores of that island and all the different names that a wave can have. Now, if you know anything about Yanua, and we look at this wave, we see that everything about that wave is female. The prefixes tell us that the wave itself is female, her back, her condensation, her spit, her stomach. Because it, the wave is also a sea snake. Now, Descartes would have that those two entities are polar opposites to each other. They are a binary. A wave cannot be a snake. And yet, in a sense, for these people, they're one and the same thing. There is no separation. The wave and the sea snake are one and the same thing. It just depends on your angle of perception at any one time. And the waves are always feminine, but the sea itself is masculine. And then we get into some really complicated understandings of a way an environment is being conceptualized. So, here we have that place, that wave place, is right on the tip of this island, this place called Mulua. And we have this red line running here. And this red line is one of my passions, and many other lines like it. In the literature, often known as song lines. Bruce Chatwin, of course, gave us the terminology. 
But Bruce, when he wrote his book, was looking from the outside in. But what happens when you look at a songline from the inside out? And using the language that wants to describe that songline. Well, the first thing we find is that in January, at least, you can never talk about a songline in the past tense or the future tense. The only way you can ever talk about them is the present tense. It is running, it is flowing, it is moving, it is being. Because that song line, even today, is like a water main outside this university. It is a conduit of flowing substance. And a singer of a song line like this only becomes the amplifier for what is already present in the land. And I got very interested in these song lines because I realized that they recorded all the ecological information, the biological information about Yanua country. All the landforms, all the plants, all the animals, all what we might call the, uh, the weather, all that kind of natural phenomena. So this is just one of many, many song lines. And it's very esoteric knowledge. But if you want to be a professor in a community like this, this is what makes you the professor. Not the floppy hat and the black gown. The singer of these songs is the professor, is the owner of the ultimate way to know, because singing these things is the ultimate way to know. And over the years, this has been a place of great fascination for me, because these song lines also record animals that are also extinct, because they once weren't extinct. And the memory of that extinction, of non-extinction, is celebrated in the songs. So when people sing them, they say, well, that animal's not here anymore. We know it once was. I never saw one myself, but we know it was there, and old people could tell us about it. So I got this harebrained idea working with old people to start drawing these songs. What are these songs actually saying? Because an old man once said to me, if you sing these songs, it's like you've got a TV on your head. Everything comes alive. His actual word was, everything jumps up alive. But let's... That's a bit more tricky, so we'll say it's a TV on your head. So we see, this is the beginning of that song line, out in the middle of the sea at this place called Wulma. And you have tiger shark, the snubfin dolphin, which is unique to this area of the Gulf, manta rays, coral reefs, parrotfish, certain other things that are being sung. And this song line continues on. It also merges what we might call the mythological with the everyday, that the actions of a white-bellied seagull aren't just the actions of catching fish. She is also a great ancestress. And that notion of the great ancestress is also celebrated in the song. And the wave and the sea snake and migrating stingrays. Wind, storms, whales, jellyfish, and on and on it goes. This song is carrying all sorts of knowledge. This is the critical one for me. If you remember the map, this is the part where the song goes around. So this clan is a shark dreaming clan. All the sharks that you can think of belong to this clan. And before it heads onto the island, they bring all the sharks into one place and start singing them. And one day we were out on this island and we found a dead zebra shark. And it's sort of, oh, I can't even point to it, but there's a zebra shark in there, believe me. Anyway, we found a dead one. And that's how we named it. Because, you know, I came ignorant to this country. So for me... Oh, little shark, big shark, spotted shark, stripy shark. That's how I began naming sharks. Until you actually start identifying species and Yanua names, English names, Latin names, and you start bringing it all together. But this zebra shark, I'd not seen before. Yanua people had a name for it, they could sing it, they could tell us about it. And this is where I learned a very valuable lesson about when the West meets the rest. I had a friend who was an ethiologist. And I took a photo of this shark back to him. And I said, I found this shark on Vandalin Island. And knowing this fellow, I thought, well, he'd say straight away, well, it's this type of shark, John. And he said, but you couldn't have seen it there, John. That was his first response. You could not have seen that shark there. And I said, but I did. Here's the photo. No, John, you couldn't have. And I looked at him again and I said, but I did. He said, but it's not being discovered yet. And I said, what are you telling me? He said, well, no, it's not being recorded in that part of Australia. And I said, so indigenous people have got it wrong. Well, they have to. 
Okay. Ten years later, an ex-student of mine who went and worked with him found this shark out there. And then they both rang up very excited and said, we found your shark, John, we've discovered it. Can we use the annual name to name it? And the community said, no, you can't. And I thought, well, that's a bit of poetic justice, actually, because there had been a denial from the beginning that what people had found actually existed. And this has happened with a few species in Yanyua country, where unless it's discovered by the West, it does not exist. It's just hearsay evidence that it exists. Well, if people can sing it, and people can describe it, and people can dance it, I'm sorry, it exists. It's real. It's tangible. This stuff can't be made up. Country is also celebrated in other ways. Now, many of us are probably interested and in know of the great artworks that Indigenous people have produced in Australia, you know, the great dot paintings of the desert and all sorts of other artworks. Well, when I first went to Borololo over three decades ago, I saw no art. And I'd made this common assumption, all Aboriginal people paint art. Well, no. In ceremonies, yes. And then I found out that the art form of Yanua people was song poetry. The creation of haiku-like song poems that both men and women compose. Today they're held by this group of old women, one of whom is still alive here, Dinah. So this is her song. And we can look at those words and we don't think they mean much, but they're like haiku. You have to bring a whole lot of other knowledge into here to understand. I've tried to put some pictures together to give you a little bit more of an idea of the islands, of the white-bellied sea eagle that travelled between those two places. And I suppose somebody just before got up and sang beautifully. Well, every time I do this thing, Dinah says, well, you've got to sing for him too. So I'll just sing it, just to give you an idea, because words don't do anything. All right, so we get music in something that's meant to be about other ways of knowing. Well, this is another way of knowing. And on it goes. For the outsider, it means very little. But for the inside, these things are redolent with all kinds of meaning about the celebration of country. And here's Dinah, 80 years old. And she got tired of somebody incessantly asking her how she knew something. And it was about the land. And I watched this, and I thought, I'm not going to say anything. I just watched what happens here. And this person was asking her, well, how do you know that's on that country? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? And then she just got up and danced. And a few women were with her, and they sang for her. And then she sat down and she said, now you know how I know. So what we're dealing with here is knowledge that is encoded in total embodied ways of being. Not all knowledge is the head. The whole body is a site of knowing. For all of us, not white, not black. We, if we're cognizant of our own body, it is a complete site of knowing. And for Dinah, it was the only way that she could prove to this questioner that she did know something. Which again throws Dake out the window. I think, therefore I am. I dance, therefore I am. I move my body, therefore I am, because I can demonstrate to you my knowledge about my land. Now, it's very easy to put this stuff in a box called exotic, in a box called culture, in a box called Aboriginal culture. But for the people who hold it, this is pragmatic, everyday knowledge that slips seamlessly between the caring of children, the sending of grandchildren to school, to the cooking of meals, to doing everything that all of us do, but this knowledge lives there as well. There isn't a separate space called Dinah Dances. There's not a separate space called Let's Sing Now. There's not a separate space that says We Know This Shark Now. This is infused throughout everyday life. And it always blows my mind, you know, you think after 37 years, you know something. 
and you go back and you sit down and this old lady might say something, you go, whoa, where'd that come from? And it might be in the middle of her demand for chewing tobacco. But you get something and go, wow. And it might be really deep information that is just handed out as a tin of tobacco is handed to her. I know I shouldn't be talking about tobacco, but this old lady loves it, so fine. Okay, Jugong. The red is all English has. Jugong. Then gets a bit cleverer and goes Jugong, Jugong. This is not all the annual words for Jugong. This is just a few of them. And what we're dealing with here is really intimate ways of knowing a particular species. Age, sex, action, movement, location. All are embedded in these names. Each one of these names takes a whole paragraph to translate. I've actually done a great disservice by reducing it to one line. And of interest is something, the one that really sticks with me is Ji Rama, Lone Male Jugong. One of my supervisors for a PhD is a, the world's expert on Jugong, Professor Helene Marsh at the James Cook University. And when she was going through these, she said, John, tell me about this Ji Rama. What's going on here? And I said, well, it's a Lone Male Jugong. It lives by itself on the seagrass bed. Well, I've never heard of one of them. So we got some funding together and we actually tagged one. Now, Yanua people will tell you they've got verbs to describe the action of this, ver this, of this jugong. And we tagged it and we get back to shore and we open up the laptop. And there it is, round and round and round, days on end, it never moved. So we started asking some more questions. Why is it staying there? Well, because it keeps the seagrass healthy. What? Well, seagrass has got to be ripped up. And if you don't rip up seagrass, it doesn't grow. So they say, he's like the gardener. When all the other jugong move off, he stays behind to make sure that when they come back, the seagrass is healthy. So we went to the seagrass experts and they said, yeah, they're right. That's how seagrass works. If you don't dig seagrass, it doesn't meet, it doesn't get to its maximum potential as a plant growing because it demands photosynthesis and digging up. Just a few other jugong. But this is also what happens to Jugong. In the greed for money when people want to eat barramundi. The annual people take, on average, 13 a year by traditional method, harpooning. The night this happened, there were over 30 killed in one night. And I remember the day we went out in the boat to see all this. And it wasn't just the loss of a food source that people keened in the boat. It was the loss of kin, of established relationships. And the saddest part about it is people themselves felt guilty that it had happened, that they weren't apportioning blame on the fishermen. They were taking what the fishermen had done and giving it back to themselves. It's our fault this happened. We haven't fought hard enough to protect these dugong. We haven't fought hard enough to make sure fishermen know how to set barramundi nets. So, there's no easy stories to some of these things. These are sites of conflict, sites of contestation about how species are to be managed. And so we move through Yanua country. And this term country isn't just like Germany, Japan, Italy, Greece. It's not this conceptual idea of a geographic political land unit. In a Yanua sense, and from Aboriginal people Australia-wide, country is that place that gives and receives. Country is that place that is also sentient. Country is that place that gives you something back if you act in the right way. Because country also can take away from you. And so we're in a boat... And here is this big rock with two white-bellied seagulls on top of it. The old lady in the boat said, quick, take a photo. And we took the photo. Because that rock is also the body of the white-bellied seagull. If you want to understand where all white-bellied seagulls come from in the Gulf of Carpentaria, they come from that rock. Because that's its spiritual home. 
And for the old lady concerned, there were two really live ones on top, which spoke to her of these bonds of kinship, because her in the boat, that was her mother's country. So she saw this complete idea of her in relation to her mother's dreaming, in relation to her mother's live animal. Now the interesting thing also about this place is it is a gendered place. No woman would dare go there. It is a men's only place. And this is an important understanding in terms of knowledge. In a place like this institution, nearly all knowledge is free, except for the fees you pay, of course. But you can go and learn what you want to learn. Turn on a computer, Google it, go to the library, get a book. In indigenous communities, knowledge is not free. If you were to go there today in a boat and go past that place, you might go past that place for five years before they actually tell you what that rock is. They would tell you, you can't go there. Don't ask why. That's one thing people I work with say, why do white people always ask why? Why can't they just understand that some things are just the way they are? It's law. So this notion of questioning doesn't always bring out good results when you're working with indigenous people. I found this out, you know, I used to try and feign ignorance to try and le relearn something I'd forgotten. And people just say, we taught you that. Why are you asking this question? Why do white fellows have to write everything down? Why can't you put it up in your head and leave it there? So this site generates all these kinds of questions about what is knowledge and who can own knowledge and on what basis can knowledge be shared? Who has the right to share that knowledge? Knowledge is fundamentally political because knowledge is power. This is a, one of the largest strandings of shortfin pilot whales in the Northern Territory's history that we know of, over 40. And Graham is sitting there and you think, well, it's a bit of an awful photo with lots of dead whales and Graham. And yet if we know how to read this photo, it actually tells us an enormous amount. When these whales were stranded, the CSIRO said, we've got to get to those whales because we've got to get tissue samples because we want to know about their genes, their genetic pooling. And Graham is the head of the rangers, and he said, sure, you can come up, by all means. So, we get in the boat, and we're going out, and we hit the zone of stench. And then Graham stops the boat, and the scientists are there getting everything out, the little bottles and the scalpels and whatever else is needed to do this job, and he just says, stay in the boat, just stay in the boat. And one of the fellows says, yes, but we came all this way, just stay in the boat. And he jumps out of the boat's waist-deep water, and he speaks in language, he goes forward towards these whales going, I mourn for you, my mother. I grieve that this is what has happened to you. Do not be ignorant towards me, because I am here the guardian of you who is my mother. And we have people in the boat who wish to come to you and take your flesh, but they will do you no harm. And then he came back to the boat and said, yes, go and do what you want to do now. See how simple it is? The science can still happen. The knowledge can still be shared as long as the protocol is respected. We may not have understood a word of that protocol, but it was the obligation that had to be fulfilled. It's very easy. i just throw this one in because this is a key issue for me. This is The Age, in a Victorian paper, of course, and this was a glossy magazine that was put there about five years ago in the middle of the Saturday Age. It's all about the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's all about the Sir Edward Pellew Islands called Barra Beer and Bullets. A fishing club becomes a town, then goes feral. And all it was about was dysfunctional white people who were trying to protect their fishing spots and were shooting each other and stealing each other's beer and their wives, and it just went on and on and on. It made the best television program. There was not one mention in all of this about anything to do with Yanua people and their understanding of this country, their understanding of the Barramundi. So Borolulu was just turned into a little old wild west town. And for the indigenous community, when they saw this, they were so shamed. 
because it's their country, that place that gives and receives life. They're so tired of explaining the mad functionings of this group of white people. How do we understand these people that have no relationship to except to kill a fish to eat it and take a photo of it? So this goes into the whole notion again of how we speak of this relationship. What is our relationship to such a place? And how do we construct that relationship? And how do we talk of that relationship? And the same goes with fishermen. In 1985, this stretch of river was the biggest cold season camping ground for all indigenous people in the Borolola area. Everyone would go down there. And the kids would be educated in all sorts of things. And then, it, without any word of, from anywhere, it was turned into a fishing club. And it's now nearly a town unto itself, called King Ash Bay Fishing Club. Gone are the other names of Lalladula, Jawuma, Wadalwanga, Nganinja, Ruangala. Gone is the notion of who owns it through that clan system. People have been removed from that place by the actions of the economy of amateur fishermen, who in the Northern Territory are as nearly powerful as the gun lobby in the United States. Incredibly powerful group of people. Borolola, 60 kilometers south of it, is the biggest lead, silver, and zinc mine in the world. And to get to the ore body, they had to move the MacArthur River five kilometers. The fifth largest river system in the Northern Territory had to be moved to get underneath it. And Yanua people, Guranji people, Garawa people, Mara people from that area went to Darwin to demonstrate, as is their right as citizens. Now, the irony of that demonstration is for a week they stood out Parliament while that was debated. And their member, one of the local members, was Mullandilly McCarthy, who's now a newsreader for NITV. She was a member in the Parliament. She crossed the floor to vote against this. The threats given to her because she crossed the floor were appalling. The threats given to this assembled group of people were appalling. Because the same old story of you are just holding up progress. Why don't you get real about progress? But if you listen to what people were talking about, they were saying, look, we understand that you want to make this mine. That's fine. But you're only talking about a five kilometer stretch of the river, and we think there's a lot more to the river than what you're looking at, because it goes all the way to the sea. We want a conversation about the total ecosystem. Can we have that? No. You're not going to get that. And I saw a woman who's standing in the crowd there tear apart the Minister for the Environment at the time, who was Peter Garrett. Tore him apart because he would not move from his five kilometre zone. And refused, as the Federal Government Minister, to look at the whole river system, which was really concerning these people. And it does make sense. Any of us that think about this, whether we were a lay person or a hydrologist to whoever. It makes sense to look at the complete system and what might happen. And yet Yanua people do work constantly with scientists to explore the value of that world of science to them. So here we have Scott Whiting, who is one of Australia's lead sea turtle biologists, working with Tom, Thomas Simon. Thomas Simon could describe himself as being a direct descendant of the sea turtle ancestor. And here they are preparing tracking devices. And the Yanua community have now begun ecotourism at this marine turtle camp. So we're not against, there's no against development, against tourists. It's about the sharing of knowledge in a way that is equal, where both groups of people get something out of it. Scott gets a whole lot of indigenous ways of understanding about sea turtles, about living on country and what that means. In exchange, Thomas gets a whole lot of knowledge about sea turtles and he incorporates that into his body of knowledge as well. So this thing called indigenous knowledge is not static. It's constantly growing just as our knowledge grows. But the premise of Thomas's knowledge is always going to be that sea turtle is my ancestor. And it did a whole lot of things on my country that means it's mine. And then on top of all that, he will add, 
the Latin names, the European names, and all the other things about sea turtles that he's learnt. And the rangers do this every October. They know GIS. So we can't constrain indigenous people's knowledge just to their own realm that we might think a difficult place to try and enter. They're more than willing to enter into the space of what we might call Western scientific knowledge as well. But the question really, if we start following this, is how do we build the epistemological bridge between those two ways of knowing? Instead of contesting, how do we build the bridge so that it's safe for both groups of people to cross into each other's knowledge? You may not always grasp the ontology, but the epistemology is in your face. So how do you build that bridge? That's the question that is constantly occupying my mind. How do we do it so that both groups' ways of knowing are seen to be valid? And I won't just use the term indigenous knowledge because we could put here Wiradjuri knowledge, Yanua knowledge, Garua knowledge, Jambara Poingung knowledge, Pitninjara knowledge, whosever knowledge it is. Because this thing called indigenous and Aboriginal are just a big white umbrella that was invented to put over the top of indigenous people. So whose knowledge are we actually talking about when we talk about Aboriginal knowledge? I think we have to start getting specific. Is it Jajarung knowledge? Is it Gauna knowledge? Is it Garigong knowledge? Whose knowledge? So when we start to understand that bridge, you're going to have this body of Western knowledge which is sitting here with multiple orbits around it, with all these bridges, hopefully, trying to understand how it can work. And just the last example, sea level rise. This is a little thing that I got involved with, with UNESCO. Now, the yellow is the worst case scenario. The red is the second. And when I took this map back to Borolula, and I was sitting with some old people and some young people, I looked at it and said, yeah, well, that, that's just the way it is. And I said, do you understand what they're talking about? Yeah. And then a, a, a woman about my age said, look, I'm going to draw you the sea. And I thought she'd just follow the coast. You know, the mangroves are green, then you have blue. And I thought she'd just go along the line. But she actually went 13 kilometers inland and drew the line. And she said, see? We call all of what's north of my finger the sea already. I hope you get what I mean. This is complex thinking here for these people about what is the sea. This is already sea. Even if there's no sea on it, all of what we might call terra firma is already, in their language, classified as the sea. It's sea country. And we know it gets wet already. So if that's all climate change is going to do, well, that's fine. Because it already gets wet. When the big king tides come, when the cyclones come, it's already saltwater country. So even the conceptualization between two ways of knowing is not as easy and as, as we might first think it is. Because there is a saltwater language put over the top of this country already that explains why it is sea country and why the tides can be spoken of there. And why when the song line goes through this country, they're singing the high tide, they're singing the low tide, when in reality you're still in a place where there's trees and grass and sand. Because in the conceptualization of it, it's already the sea. And it's these concepts that we grapple with. So we could look at it from the idea of, an, of transdisciplinary research. It's not interdisciplinary. It can't be. Because... To really engage with indigenous knowledge, we have to move beyond the disciplines. These Western boxes, the little boxes as Seeger would have had them, are actually in the way of actually learning what indigenous people might know because we go linguistics, we go biology, we go this kind of biology, we go culture, anthropology, archaeology. Whatever box we can create is not going to work if we really want these epistemological bridges to work. So we have to move beyond these separate ideas of disciplines in the academy and take into account knowledge systems. 
And as I say here, which the university may or may never fully understand, that's beside the point. There are forms of knowledge which will resist definition from a Western academic perspective. And of course, there are some branches of the academy that may think that they never have to acknowledge indigenous practices. Well, I think that's an open question. Thank you. Look, I think there's a, a whole conversation here. But I think the first thing I'll say before even how do you come to know is you have to enter with a premise that just because something is different, it doesn't mean it's wrong. And this is what colonization has sown into Australia, that difference is wrongness. Difference is not scientific. Difference is not academic. It's not like that. This is why I like this idea of these spheres of knowledge to which we try and build bridges. So the first point is to enter into that community saying, I don't know what you know. I know you know something, I've got something too. Is there a place to have a conversation? And to do that really, you know, let me just backtrack a word. The academy in some respects is a very arrogant place. Its knowledge has created enormous arrogance in regards to it know, of what it knows. If you take that arrogance into a community, the doors are going to shut. Indigenous people have seen it far too often, at every level. Why, was, why were children stolen? It's the same reason. Why were children stopped being able to speak language? Because English was considered better. So we have these understandings of what we think knowledge is. But I think whether you're a linguist, whether you're an anthropologist, whether you're an archaeologist, whether you're a biologist, if you're going to work in a community and you want to have a relationship in that community and it is about the relational, that's what comes first. Not your professorship, not your doctorateship, none of that. It's about the ability to make a relationship. Who are you? And I mean that, what do you contain? Not anything from this place, but who are you first as a human being? That's really the point. And I'm, I'm not trying to be fanciful here. I'm not trying to be, how can I put it, new age. I'm not. It's really common sense. Because when you demonstrate who you are, you open yourself up to the possibility of a relationship. And in that relationship, there will be the sharing of something. And that's the point at which people say, so what is it you really want to know? And then things happen. So that's the point. You know, my colleagues over here could tell me I'm wrong. I'm not sure. But for me, that's the point. And it gets back to the very thing I started with on the notion of being in relation to. Being in relationship with. Sure, you might come out with your PhD you might come out with your doctorate or whatever. But I think for any of us that have gained the knowledge from Indigenous people, there has to be a mighty thank you. And I read so many scientific articles, I read so many articles in my own discipline where when you read them you say you could not have got this knowledge by yourself and yet there is no acknowledgement of who else was there giving that information. And yet, we, in the academy, if we see ourselves plagiarised, if we see our knowledge being sown into somebody's article and we know they could not have got that knowledge without me, what do we do? We go to the court, we jump up and down and say, this is wrong. Well, it's the same principle. We want to know what's on indigenous lands and we want to work with the people whose knowledge is there, and let's be honest, for many indigenous communities, they have been on that country for generation after generation after generation. They are master empiricists. We have to start acknowledging. So that acknowledgement to country isn't just about the old days. You know, and some black fellows that walked around here before Captain Cook came. It's actually about now and what's going on. And I think the academy really has to learn this. It really has to learn 
that when you get your cap and gown, if you've been working with indigenous people, it's actually been a two-way system of communication that's got you to that point. And I often think universities should graduate the mentors that have taught the people who are graduating as well. That might be a bit extreme for the academy, but I often think that's the case. <laughs> Thank you.